Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be back at Sykeston and uh, to be here in the house. And uh, I hope you know what a, what a gift you have in Justin and Meredith. Um, you just, yeah, they deserve a round of applause. They, they love Jesus and they love Sykeston. And depending on the day, I don't know which one they love more, um, especially Justin. When I wait... I'll tell him, hey, I'm coming south, you know, I'm going to get past the Benton Hill and it's going to flatten out. And he, every time I tell him that, he's like, welcome to God's country. Um, so, and I am, I'm from the Boot Hill, uh, a little further south of here, about as far south of the Boot Hill as you can get. It's where I'm from. I've been in this Cape seven years and people still ask me, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from here now, I guess. I don't know. They're like, you don't talk like you're from here. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. I talk how I'm supposed to talk. Um, you know, and so... I, thinking about thinking about Sykes and, and what's happening here at this campus and across the board and you know seven years ago, um, my really they I say they're a gift to y'all but they've been a gift to us. Justin and Meredith have been some of our closest friends, some of our best friends in life and in ministry this last seven years. And if you think back over the last seven years, we're living in the middle of stuff that six years ago we were saying, man, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome to see God do this or see people's lives change like that or birth dreams like this? And we're, we were living, literally living in the middle of what ifs and prayers coming true. And, uh, and that's all. I mean, just thanks to, thanks to God and thanks to you guys for believing in the dream, being part of what God's doing right here. I love this campus. I love what it's doing in the city. Because you're not just at a place where you're getting fed the word of God. You're at a place that's literally turning Sykes and upside down for the glory of God. And families are being changed and lives are being transformed. And uh, uh, you baptize, you will baptize more people today than what some churches will do in years. And then just in one day, I, I talked to one of the, bab- the guys who got baptized, a guy named Jimmy in the first service, came up after service, shook my hand. And we were talking and he said, you know, sometimes the enemy likes to remind me of what I've done. Uh, he said, but I left that in the water today. And uh, isn't that, that's just a great picture of baptism and a great picture of what we're going to talk about today, about being made righteous in God. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go to the book of Romans. How many of you brought your Bibles with you today? See several Bibles. And then uh, if you haven't gotten one of these yet, we've got our Summer in Rome journals out there. We encourage you just to grab one of those in the Bible reading plan and so we can study the Word of God together. As we are in this series, Summer in Rome, uh, when Justin and I and Pastor Nate, Pastor Gary were talking through this series, we, we, it, the first initial thought when we said Summer in Rome was, you know, summer vacation. How many of you have already been on summer vacation? How many of you are getting ready to go on summer vacation? How many of you can't afford to go on summer vacation? Yeah, me, okay. <laughs> and so we were, we were thinking about summer in Rome. That the initial thought was like, oh, summer vacation. How awesome would that be to go to Rome and spend a summer there? But then as we were talking, I remember having the conversation. And I said, what if instead of thinking summer vacation, you think study abroad? Because if you consider it, the way you pack for those trips are totally different. If you're going on summer vacation in Rome, you're going to pack certain outfits and you're going to put certain things in your carry-on and certain things in your luggage. But if you're going on a study abroad trip and you're there for educational purposes, the way you plan and prepare for that trip is totally different. And what the reason we say study abroad this summer, when we say summer in Rome in the book of Romans, is we don't want to casually stroll through the book of Romans. We want to study deep into the book of Romans. That's why we've been resourcing you. These aren't gimmicks. The, these aren't just things because we were like, well, we don't have anything to really spend money on. That's not why we did this. This is because we want you to, to not just study it here on Sunday, but to go home and dive into the book of Romans. We, we've already, we've given you a cheat sheet for the entire summer. You know what we're going to preach. Now, think, you know what we're going to preach all the way through the next, I don't know, however many weeks. We've got 10 more weeks of this series. You should come in on the next 10 weeks and be like, well, I've already read it, so let's see what they got. Right, that's what this should be about. And so, so we've been for week four of summer in Rome. We've learned already in the first three weeks, week one, I'm unashamed of the gospel. Week two, I'm done with excuses. Last week on Father's Day, we talked about I'm living by faith. Just about Father's Day, anybody enjoy a donut last week? And I told him at Cape, I said, we're just helping you with your dad bods this week, guys, because those donuts were awesome. This week, we're going we're gonna to get into our next I am statement. Before we do that, I want to celebrate a, a number with you. In the last three weeks, across all locations, we have 87 people gave their life to Jesus at Discover Life Church. 
35 of them have given their life at Sykeston. 35 people have given their life to Jesus right here at this location. So if you missed the last three weeks, you can find them on YouTube. Romans, remind you, is a book written by the Apostle Paul. Who is the Apostle Paul in Scripture? You first find him. He is the coat rack at the death of Stephen, the first martyr for Jesus. He's the one who holds the coat as they stone him for his faith in Jesus. He becomes one of the greatest persecutors of the Christian faith. He does not like Jesus. He does not like his followers. He doesn't believe in Christianity. He doesn't think the Messiah has come on the scene. And then one day, we read it in the book of Acts, he has an encounter on the road to Damascus and he experienced Jesus and everything changes in his life. And he goes from being a persecutor of Christians to one of the leaders of the Christian faith. And most of the New Testament Bible is written by, the, by, the, by uh, Paul. He is a, because he's not just someone who got his life changed, he's an intelligent man. He is an intellectual man. And so he has this unique ability to take the life change he experienced and pin it down and put it in words. And he becomes one of the really, uh, his writings are where we find a lot of doctrine. They're where we find a lot of theology. They're where we find the foundations of our faith because he can take what he experienced and he can put it in words. And really the book of Romans is 16 chapters of theology and doctrine. And today we're going to dive into the deep end of the theological pool. And we're going to talk about one of the most important truths in our relationship with God. Here's your week four I am statement from the book of Romans. I am made righteous. I am made righteous. You say, what does that mean? Well, we're going to discover it today. But this simple, short definition is this. Righteousness simply means that I'm in right standing with God. And then, that when I'm forgiven, when I accept Jesus as my Savior, pray the prayer of repentance, that immediately what happens is I come in right standing with God. It's important to understand that because we look at forgiveness a lot of times through carnal eyes and through fleshly nature. And I can forgive somebody but not have a relationship with them after that. Anybody ever had a situation like that in your life? There's been people that I've forgiven, but you hurt me, you hurt me deep enough, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm not going to have a relationship with you. And that's not the God we serve. God doesn't say I'm going to forgive you, but stay away. God says, I'm not just going to forgive you. I'm going to make sure our relationship is so unstained and so unblemished that you're going to always be in right standing with me. And that's what it means to be the righteousness of God is that I'm in right standing with God. And so, so let's look at this. If you have your Bibles, I, I believe you guys do this around here. Let's stand as we read the word of God in honor uh, of, of the word. Romans chapter four, we're going to start in verse 16 and read all the way to the end of that chapter verse 25 so if you haven't read the word today then I'm going to catch you up okay we'll get your Bible reading in here's what it says in verse 16 therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us of us all verse 17 as it is written I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who, who believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they do. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. So let me catch you up. What's happening? He's talking about Abraham. Who is Abraham? Abraham is the father of our faith. We, we read his story in the book of Genesis. Abraham gets a promise at 75 that he's going to have a son, that he's going to become the father of many nations. And he lives 25 years in that promise. Now, I did this in the first. I was going to ask anybody in the room over 70. All right, a few of you. Anybody want to have a kid at this age? Right? No. There was one lady in the first service, she didn't hear the question right because she raised her hand. And then she was like, no, no, I do not. Right? No. no. That's where Abraham, Abraham is 75 years old and he gets a promise that a young man should get. That you're going to have a child and, and, and then the Bible says that he has this faith 
that even though none of it makes sense, even though I'm an old man, even though my wife is aging, that her womb should not reproduce, I'm going to keep the faith that we're going to have a child. And here's what it says in the next verse. And he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. He gave glory to God and he was fully convinced that he had promised and he was also able to perform. And I just want to stop right here and say, I think that's a word for somebody in the room today that you have to have this faith that if God promised it, God can do it. Let me introduce you to one of my core convictions in life. I believe there is no expiration date on the word of God. And if God said he'll do it, he will do it. It's not like a carton of milk in the fridge and it expires. I don't care if it's been five months, five years, or 25 years. If God said he'll do it, he will do it. We just have to keep the faith and believe that he'll do it. That's what Abraham did. And here's the result of that faith. Here's the result of him not doubting. In verse 23, it says, therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone. This is important. And it was imputed to him. Verse 24, it says, but it was also written for you and me. For Discover Life Church, for those who would be at Sykeston campus today, it was for us, so it shall be imputed to you and me who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, and I thank you that we are made right with you because of the sacrifice of Jesus. I pray that today you give us ears to hear, a mind to comprehend, a heart willing to change and respond. I pray that you'd use me in spite of myself, my fears, and all of my failures. It's in Jesus' name we pray. The church said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to show you a few things from verse 22. It talks about how it was credited to him as righteous. As a matter of fact, uh, in the amplified version of Scripture, it says that that is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness, that he was in right standing with God. Here's what it says in the New Living Translation. It says, and because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. It's important. I'm going to get into it here in a moment, but you need to see this. Why did God count him as righteous? Because he worked real hard? Because he did a lot of good things? Because he gave a whole lot of money? No, it's just because he believed and he had faith. And that faith credited him as righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Simply said, it means we are in right standing with God. Righteousness is a crucial topic. It's especially crucial to the book of Romans. So as you read through the book of Romans this summer and we preach through the book of Romans, there's going to be several different passages of scripture that use the word righteous. As a matter of fact, 35 times the, the word righteousness is mentioned in the Bible or in the book of Romans. 35 times it's mentioned in the book of Romans. It's almost like this. It's almost like Paul is trying to tell us, like, listen, 35 times I'm going to remind you you're in right standing with God. 35 times because one time you're not going to get it. Two times you're not going to get it. I guess Paul, I don't, he didn't have kids that I know of in scripture, but he must've been around some kids, right? Because it's like my kids, if I tell them once or twice, they don't hear it. But I, I finally, I got my middle child. We got to hurry because she's this is her second service. And Pastor Aaron's out of town today, right? So if you want to keep your volunteers, I got to get this thing done. Because my middle child, I have to sit down and say, Indy Bell, look me right here in the eyes. Do not get in trouble in church today. Right? We had the whole conversation. And it's what Paul is saying. He's like 35 different times. He's saying, I got to get you to understand that you are in right standing with God. It's like he's reiterating, I don't care how you feel. I don't care what you think. You have a new identity. You have a new position. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you can live with this statement, I am made righteous. Now, here's the thing. It's tough because sometimes we don't feel like it because you might think about what you did this week. You might think about the way you handled the situation at work this week. You might think about the discussion you and your wife had last night. You might think about the way you talked to your kids on the way to church this morning and be like, you know what? I, I'm not really righteous. I got some issues. Um, well, here's the thing. I want you to know this. Your broken identity is not a fixed identity. 
It's not concrete and it's not set. If you will give, if and when you give your life to Jesus, you become clay in the potter's hands and he molds you and he shapes you and he changes you. Let me put it, let me give it to you in a story that'll make sense to you. My wife and I have been married 10 years uh, this year, and about 9 or 10 years ago, we went to Springfield. I, was, uh, I had to go to uh, the headquarters for the Assemblies of God to get uh, through an interview process for my ordination, and my wife went with me. And on the way back from that trip, if you've ever been through, uh, you know, from here to Springfield, you know this. There's a lot of little speed traps between here and there, right? Anybody ever been on the receiving end of a, of, a, of a police car stopping you? Well, that's what happened. And I, you know what happened on that trip? I watched my wife do what, she, what had worked before and what had worked after, but did not work in that moment. When the cop stopped us, she cried. And that cop didn't care. That cop wrote a ticket and said you were speeding and sent us on home with it. And, uh, and we got home. And what happened when we got home is my wife thought I paid the ticket. And I thought my wife paid the ticket. And then a few months later, we get a letter in the mail from, a, from, a, from a, a police department that says, if you don't pay this fine by this day, we will issue in a warrant for your arrest. The greatest thing that happened is I checked the mail that day. <laughs> and so I had this piece of paper, this information. My wife came home and I said, I'm sorry, babe, but I'm a minister. I've got a reputation to uphold. I've got to honor God. I've got to honor my position. And I'm going to have to turn you in. She said, what are you talking about? I was like, they are going to issue a warrant. And I cannot house a felon. I can't, I mean, I can't cover you. I am not Jesus. I cannot cover your sins. I have to expose them, right? And so, uh, and then she was like, and if you do, you're going to have to bail me out. And I thought, I don't got the change for that. So we called, we, we worked it all out. We paid the bill and or paid the fine. And uh, to, the, to date, as long as I know, I haven't checked, done a background check in a while, but her, her record's still pretty clean from what I know. Um, <laughs> and here's what's, what's true. Monica, I mean, she did what we've all done. She sped, she got the ticket, she did what was wrong. And what could have happened is one moment in front of a judge, she could have paid the ultimate price for whatever that, that uh, fine was. And why am I telling you that? Because it's a good picture of what Jesus does for us. Because Romans says in chapter 3, we preached it last week, that we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short. And we are all subject to have to go before a judge and be put, to, you know, put on trial and should have to pay the ultimate price and the ultimate penalties for our sins. But one thing, Jesus stepped on the scene and he paid the price so that you and I could be made right with God. And so the Bible says that because of our acceptance of Jesus' salvation, we are in right standing with God. We're made righteous and our identity changes. We go from sinners to saints, from wrong to right, from toxic to pure, from enemies of God to friends with God. You have a new nature and when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin and your shame and your guilt. He sees your righteousness. And you say, well, Chad, that sounds too good to be true. It is too good to be true. That's why it's the gospel. So what does it mean to be in right standing? Or what does it mean to be righteous? It means to be in right standing. And here's the thing. Biblical definition of righteousness is this. It's God's own perfection in every attribute, every behavior, and every word. In other words, when the Bible refers to righteousness, he's using God as the standard, which means this. Biblical righteousness never changes despite what any group of people say or do. And why is that important? It's, it's why we, we go all the way back to week one in verse 16 of chapter one when Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's when, and, and when you get this understanding of what the gospel is and what scripture means, you uh, listen, no matter what anybody else says, no matter what anybody else thinks, if it's in the book, it's true. And we have to believe it and we have to live by it. You say, well, it's not championed and it's not celebrated and it's not popular. I don't care it's still the word of God and it is still appropriate for our lives and everything in it is exactly how it should be so so here's the thing the bad news about biblical righteousness is this it's not possible for man to attain it because the standard is far too high the good news 
is that true righteousness is possible not because we got to work to get to it, but because when we accept Jesus and the forgiveness of sins by Jesus, then we, are, we have an infilling of the Holy Spirit and he allows us to be seen as righteous. We have no ability to achieve righteousness in and of ourselves, but we can still be righteous because of what Jesus did. Let me introduce you to one of my favorite verses in Scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is my, one of my all-time favorite verses in Scripture because what does it mean? Jesus took off the nature of royalty. He put on the identity of a man. So that you and I could take off the identity of men and put on the nature of royalty. That he didn't do anything wrong. He never made a mistake. He never got angry with anybody. He never, he never had ill will. He never, he never done anything that would make God not proud of him. But he took on every one of our shames and our mistakes and our sins for one reason. So that we could become the righteousness of God through his sacrifice. So on the cross. Jesus was treated as if he was full of sin, even though he wasn't. And the consequence and the repercussion of that is that we get treated like we're not full of sin, even though we have been. Aren't you thankful today for the sacrifice of Jesus? So here's the thing. And I'm going to move quickly because we've got a lot of people to get dunked in the water today. The big question for anybody who's thinking in the room is this. If I've been made righteous, why do I still struggle? Why do I have this temptation? Why do I have this problem with anger? Why do I have a hard time forgiving? Why am I struggling with an addiction? And I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm going to be able to tell you the difference is between perfect righteousness and progressive righteousness. So there are two primary uses of the word righteousness. One in Romans 4.22 we read is accounted to us. It's imputed to us. It's credited to us. And God gives it to us through faith which comes from, a, from God as a gift the moment that you and I say yes to him. The other use of the word righteousness would be a righteousness that we live out in our daily lives. And so, again, one theologian said that one is perfect while the other is progressive, but they're both by faith. Let me show you what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote this letter, too, to the church in Ephesus, and he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You didn't do this on your own. It's a gift from God. Verse 9 says, And it's not of works lest anyone should boast. So what is he telling us? He says, you didn't get the gift of righteousness. Or you didn't get the gift of faith. That all came from God. You weren't good enough. You didn't work hard enough. Your resume wasn't built better, uh, you know, good enough. If you did, you could boast about it, but you can't boast about it because it's not on your own. And we see this. It's a clear picture that the gift of righteousness comes from the perfect person of Jesus. But we read the next verse, and here's what it says in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. You just said it wasn't about works, and now you're saying I'm supposed to work. What does that mean? And it says God even prepared us beforehand that we should do the work. So verse 9 says not of works. Verse 10 says we're created for good works. And it's this, it's this second primary expression of righteousness that it's progressive. That it's part of our daily lives. That we're always working at it. See, it's so very important to understand what progressive righteousness means and how it is a direct correlation to perfect righteousness. Because too often we reverse the two. Too often we put too much emphasis on how we act instead of what he's done. And so we think if we fail one time, if we make one mistake, then everything Jesus did on the cross is void. But that's, listen, can I tell you, I don't have time to dive into it, but your salvation is not that fragile. I grew up in this, in this, in this church that made me think that if I, if I stubbed my toe, thought a dirty word, and the rapture happened, I wasn't going to make it. Now, can I tell you, 
Your salvation is not that fragile. And let me help you. I'm not preaching once saved, always saved. I don't believe that. I believe that we can make mistakes and we can walk away from our relationship with the Lord. But I, can I also tell you the Bible says his grace is sufficient for you. And you don't have to live in constant fear that you are one mistake away from losing everything in your walk with God. That there, is, there is a grace. Now get, let me help you with this. I'll tell you what I tell men all the time and what I tell parents all the time. Give yourself grace but not an excuse. I'm not giving you an excuse to stay in a sin pattern. I'm telling you there's grace if you're willing to repent and keep trying to overcome the thing that you're struggling with. And so it's this progressive righteousness that I'm not, I, I've not got it all figured out yet, but I'm moving in that direction. So let me, let me talk to you about it. Let me talk to you about perfect righteousness. And here's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. It says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation verse 19 or even so through one man's righteousness righteous act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life and it's this juxtaposed between Adam in the Old Testament and Jesus is sacrificed in the New Testament. If you go back to Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve are the first, uh, they're the first created beings on earth. And Adam, he sinned, Adam and Eve sinned. Um, Adam does what all men do. He played the blame game, right? He, he blamed his wife and God when he, when he said it. Because he was like, the woman that you gave me. What's he saying? It ain't my fault. But he had a part to play in it. It was his fault. He, he blew it all. He put everybody into sin. And as a result, we all live and we are all born into a sin nature. The thing, but though what the Romans is teaching us here is Jesus did the opposite. One man ruined it, but another man fixed it. The perfect Adam, Jesus came on the scene and his righteous act brought justification for all people. Again, righteousness. We are in right standing with God. We have been put in right standing, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did for us. So it's not on us, but how do we receive it? The only way that you can receive righteousness is by faith in Jesus. Let me put it this way. Righteousness is not achieved by works. It's received by faith. It's not achieved by works. It's received by faith. Let me help you. Do not confuse righteousness with holiness. Holiness is your conduct. Righteousness is who you are in Christ Jesus. So this has to be understood because it's our tendency as people and as, as humans to want to work and earn something. And, and if we live with this, thing, uh, this idea, we'll have flawed thinking that says, I want to be made right with God, so here's what I have to do. I can't smoke. I can't drink. I can't have sex outside of wedlock. I, I need to give more money. i got to serve the poor. If I feel a little extra guilty, if I don't have any fun, if I'm miserable enough, then I will find approval with God. We believe that. Can I help you? That's never going to work. you got to stop trying that because it's not based on what you do. It's based on who he is and what he's done. Isaiah 64 says, we are all inflicted and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, when we try to show God how good we are, he says they are nothing but filthy rags. I won't go into the detail of what that means, but it's pretty graphic. And, the, and, and in, in God's eyes, no matter our best day is still not good enough. That's why he had to send his son to die for us. Every other religion in humanity teaches that man does the work to reunite with God. But Christianity teaches that God did the work to reunite with man. He paid the price for us. That's why Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says God showed his great love for us. By sending Christ to die for us when? While we were still sinners. While we were still messed up. While we were still making mistakes. So being right with God has nothing to do with my human attempts. It is only made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus. Nobody, let me help you, nobody's going to get to heaven one day and say, I got here because of what I did or how good I was. It will always be because of what he did and how good he was. That says, and our part is to believe and receive. You are righteous because God said you're righteous. And can I help somebody? You don't need a second opinion about that one. He said it. It's good enough. So let's tackle the next problem that we've already brought up is I'm righteous, 
but I still got issues. I told him in the first service, maybe that needs to be our next shirt at, at Discover Life Church. I'm righteous, but I still got issues. <laughs> We do. We have issues. So that gets into progressive righteousness. And media team, don't hate me, but I skipped over some verses, so you have to catch up to me. <laughs> progressive righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But then it says, awake to righteousness. Become aware that you have been made righteousness. You have been made righteous in God through Jesus. When you become righteous minded, you will live in a deeper fellowship with the Father. You will also become more aware of your daily decisions, responses, and actions. Let me put it this way the more your new nature is discovered, the more you are delivered. So the more, you, the more you discover who you are in Jesus and what he says about you and the things that he promises you, then the more that you begin to look like what he says about you, the more you learn who you are in Jesus, the more you're delivered from who you used to be. Because when you get saved, your identity changes, but that doesn't mean every part of your life is immediately changed. That's why Romans 10, Paul says it this way. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, but it's with your mouth that you profess that you have faith and are saved. So it's salvation, then deliverance. Let me break it down for you. Salvation happens both immediately and incrementally. That immediately it happens in your spirit, but incrementally in your mind and your body. Another word for this is sanctification. And sanctification is instantaneous and a process. Again, I told you, we're getting into the deeper end of the theological pool. So we're using words that you may not be, you may have heard all of your life if you've been in church, but you may have never been really taught what they mean. Sanctification is the process of becoming like Jesus. And that, when you give your life to Jesus, it is instant and it's a process. And you say, how do you know? Because in, in 2006, when I gave my life to the Lord, there was things I walked out of that church service and immediately knew, I got to do some things different. I can't talk like that no more. I can't watch that anymore. I probably don't need to hang out with that person anymore. And there were some immediate changes in my life that I knew I had to make. But I, now, I'm not going to do math in front of you, but 16, 17 years later, however many years it's been, can I tell you the Lord's still working on me? And stuff I didn't have conviction about in 2006, I've got conviction about in 2023 because as I draw closer to the Lord, as I study the word more, as I have accountability in my life, that sanctification process is becoming more progressive. And I'm, I, I look more like Jesus than I do now or than what I did back then. That's part of the sanctification process. And so our sanctification is made possible not by striving, but by discovering what God has said that we are. And can I help you? It's going to take some time. It's going to, let me, let me, it's going to take some time. I, can I tell you a story? I didn't tell this in the first service, but I got a few more minutes than I did in the first service. I was, uh, I was at a restaurant about a year ago, uh, having lunch with a guy and there was a, a, a middle-aged business owner that was there. And, uh, and he's, he, was tell, he was talking to me and talking about how much he loved service and how awesome it was. And then he introduced me to another business guy that he was having lunch with. And he said, this is my pastor. And he preached a blankety-blank sermon on Sunday. And I thought, oh, okay. Never been introduced this way before. Never been told that was how good of a sermon it was before. <laughs> What's it a picture of? God moved on him, but he's still working in him, right? <laughs> and so he had an experience with God, but he still got some rough edges. Let me help you in the room. If you're in church today and you got rough edges, welcome to Discover Life Church. We like you just the way you are, and we'll let God smooth you out as you continue to walk with him. It's a process. It's a progressive righteousness. So let me put it this way. The more you know your new nature, the more your old nature will change. Righteousness is not the product of good works. Righteousness is the producer of good works. Man will always be interested in behavior, but God is interested in belief. And the more your beliefs change, the more your behavior will change. I know you don't feel it at times, but it's guaranteed 
You are right before God. And here's what I'll tell you for me. So you come to a close, band. if you want to help baptism candidates, if you want to make your way. When I struggle with what I do, I remember what God declared. When I struggle with what I do, I remember what God declared over my life. Well, I'm not good enough, and I'm not worthy enough, and I've made mistakes. I know. But that's what I do. But God still declared that I'm righteous. God still declared that I've got hope. God still declared that if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. Old things pass away. All things are made new. So you say, well, I, I don't feel worthy. Can I tell you? Let me, let me tell you this story as we wrap up. I don't feel worthy of the gift of righteousness. Let me, let me help you. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. It's going to change your life. A gift is a gift because it's a gift. I know, profound. You never thought of it that way before. What am I telling you? When someone gives you a gift, you didn't, you didn't work for the gift. You didn't earn the gift. If you did, it's not a gift. Right? You, when, when you get to the end of this week and your employer gives you a paycheck, they don't say, here's your gift. It's not a gift because you worked for it. Righteousness is not something you earn. It's something you receive. So why does God give us the gift of righteousness? Well, my wife's here on the front row. I have three little girls that are in your children's ministry this morning. I have, my oldest will be eight in August. I have a girl, little girl that'll be six in October and one that'll be two in December. So y'all pray for me as often as you can, right? Because I live with all women. It's like a disco ball blew up at my house. There's pink and glitter everywhere. I live with all women. I got two dogs, both of them are women. I got 18 chickens, all of them are hens. I live with all women, all women. <laughs> and so over the last decade, my wife's been pregnant a few times. And I've been in the delivery room every time we've had a, uh, every time one of our daughters has been born. And when you get into that delivery room, you see a side of your wife you ain't never seen before. Angry, beautiful and angry, mad, yelling, squeezing your hand. How could you do this to me? All kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. And then you go through the, the, they go through the pain of having a baby and then they hold that baby. And you know what? Let's be honest. All the dads in the room, all those babies look like aliens. They all do. They, they come, they just, they look. The only, ba- the only person who thinks that baby is cute is their mama. And that's because they're on drugs. They've drugged them. That's the only, right? And they go, the, the, the woman, the mama goes through all the labor and all the pain and all the hurt and, and, and nine months of, of growing a baby. And all, oh, y'all know all the stuff. They go through all of that. But what we do for the rest of that child's life is we celebrate and commemorate the day they were born by giving them gifts. They didn't do anything. They didn't earn anything. If anybody's going to get a gift because they earned it, it should be the mama. Because she did all the work, right? So what am I saying? Why do we give our children gifts on their birthday? Simply because they were born. Why does God give us the gift of righteousness? Simply because we were born again. It's not because you earned it or you deserved it or you worked hard enough for it. He says because you accept it and receive by faith the gift and the sacrifice of Jesus and you claim, as your, as you claim him as your Savior, I'm going to give you the gift of righteousness and I'm going to make you in right standing. I'm going to make you in right standing with God. Are you thankful for that today? I'll read one last scripture to you and I'm going to pray for you. What's the benefit of righteousness? These are the results and the benefits of righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Here's the benefits, the results of righteousness. 
You have peace with God, you have access to God, and you have hope in God. How many of you could use some more of that today? Amen.